All right, let's get started. So welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, today's theme is how can a just transition be used as a way to tackle development challenges? And this is our international launch of the report, Just Transition in the International Development Cooperation Context. Um, my name is uh, Suzanne Hedberg and I'm a communications officer at Union to Union. And Union to Union is the Swedish trade union movement's organization for international development cooperation. Uh, and I got the honor today to manage all the technical aspects of today's webinar. So let's see how that will work out. Uh, but because there are so many people of you, people in the audience from around the world, uh, we would like to invite you all to write in the chat your name and organization that you represent so that we all know who's in this digital room. Because you in the audience, we cannot hear you and we cannot see you. So. I also want to say, if you have any questions for our speakers, please write, the, write those in the Q&A box. And uh, when you write in the chat, try to select that you write to all panelists and attendees, so everyone can see what you write. All right, great. Uh, but before we actually get started, I want to just double check that we all are awake, and energized and so on. Uh, so I have a little poll here that I want to see how you guys are doing today. Let's see, you can pick one answer. So let's see, this is very, ah, nice. Okay, soon most people have voted. Oh my gosh, this is almost like Eurovision Song Contest. The polls are in. Okay, let's end this poll to see. In a curious mode, interesting and very nice to hear considering that we're today gonna be talking about just transition. And with me today, I have Samantha Smith, director for the Just Transition Center. I have Libegang Mulaisi, Labor Market Policy Coordinator at Congress of South African Trade Unions, Cursato, and Caterina Silvera, Just Transition Advisor at Union to Union. And before I actually give the word to Caterina, I want to just um, share with you guys this. This is our new report available now for download or to order, and you can do it from our website. I will shortly provide you with a link in the chat where you can download it. Uh, but Katarina, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thank you, Susanne, and uh, thank you everyone that is joining us, and special thanks for Samantha and Libogang. Please, please turn on your camera so we can see you. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about the report and why we commissioned this report uh, first and then we'll start into it. It will be very much as chit chat um, discussions throughout the things that we have. Um, we decided that it was important to take forward a, a report and we commissioned it to the Just Transition Center and then and some recommendations to it because we, we see and recognize climate change as a priority. And we also know that the ambition that we need to, to get to tackle the, the climate uh, emergency is not there. Just if we look at the emissions um, gap report from the UN environmental program that was released this week or last week, we see that even though the COVID has hit us and we saw reductions of emissions, then we also have seen that the emissions are now rising again and in some cases even above pre-COVID levels. But we also wanted to draw attention to the fact that when we're greening our societies, if we conduct um, this transformation and we build our policies in under a just transition framework, then it can actually lead to transformative change. And even like at our own portfolio as the joint international 
uh, Devel Development Cooperation Organization for the Swedish Trade Union Confederations. We know that there is interest and that trade unions are doing a lot of work on the ground. So, um, so, so we, we started this project together with Samantha and her team. And I see some of you from the Just Transition Center are also joining us. Great to see you there. Um, and so what we, we would like to hear, like, and we know I can see from the list, there are several trade unionists joining as well. They have been working with climate change issues uh, in their organizations. But Samantha, if we start with you, for somebody that has never heard of Just Transition and somebody that doesn't know how trade unions are connected to climate change, how would you, how would you explain that in short words? I mean, um, okay, so first of all, hello everyone. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to speak today and it's great to participate in the launch of this report. Um, Climate, you know, the emissions that are causing climate change, right? So carbon dioxide, methane, whatever, they come from our activities, from human activities. And those activities are part of the world of work. So if you think about it, like almost most people, unless you're a big capital owner in this world, you are a worker. And uh, our activities together determine whether or not we're going to get emissions down and do something meaningful about climate change. Um, or not. And they also, but at the same time, as everyone knows, working people are uniquely exposed to the impacts of climate change. So if you just think of all the people around the world who work outside, most in informal, insecure jobs, every single person who works outside is at risk for uh, different kinds of climate impacts while they are at work. So I think that would be one way to explain why unions matter for climate change. And then I think the other thing is just that we know from history that, you know, big economic and social change requires mass movements of people, right? That the power comes from below. And the trade unions uh, are the second largest group of organized people in the world, uh, right after people of faith. So if also, if you look at mass movements, pretty much all of the successful ones include trade unionists. Thank you, Samantha. Um, and Lev Gang, thank you for joining us from uh, Cosato. Um, would you like to add a few words? Like, how do you explain just transition and how trade unions are connected to environmental issues um, in your experience? Um, thank you, Katarina, and thank you for inviting me for today's discussion. Uh, my name is Lebohang Mulaisi. Um, as introduced, I'm the Labour Market Policy Coordinator for COSATU, the Congress of South Africa's Trade Unions. And I think Sam has, has, has um, covered the points, um, really, that, you know, because of how the labour market has been structured and how our activities um, in the labour market um, work, um, we too, as the trade union movement, participate um, in the level of emissions um, that we are currently seeing. Um, and in some way or some, some, some other way, our participation in our activities um, can be attributed to the levels of emissions um, that we currently see. And that is why um, I think, especially in, in the case of COSATU, we have committed ourselves to uh, transitioning to a low carbon economy. Also noticing that even though our activities are very much aligned to the level of emissions, those emissions in some way or some sort of way um, um, not only just contributes to, 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 to the environmental degradation, but it also has an impact on, you know, ourselves as the working class. I think um, how we've been able to package our engagements on issues of climate change is looked at how these impact, you know, the bread and butter issues of, of workers. Um, the recent droughts that we've experienced here in South Africa, um, the, 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 the flooding in certain areas, um, these all have an impact on our communities. So indirectly or directly, they'll have an impact on workers um, per se. So the way in which, you know, the activities that we do in the labor market also has a chain reaction to 
the emissions has a chain reaction into what has happened to our environment um, in years to come. So we're all sort of interlinked in some sort of way. So that's why we, we've committed to um, transitioning to a low carbon economy, but doing this in a way that does not necessarily displace um, the livelihoods of workers as well as communities um, ultimately. So those could probably be my beginning um, additions onto the points that Sam had made um, into what a just transition is in, in the most basic terms. Thank you very much for this like first um like, Great, I think the introduction is done of this theme of today's topic a little bit. I think we move on to our next uh, theme for today, right Katerina? It's different just transition in different areas around the globe. I'll hand over to you Katerina. Thank you, thank you and yeah I jumped. I, I'm very happy to have this uh, conversation today with our two uh, colleagues. Um, so as you touched upon, uh, both of you, um, just transition requires several different um, policies and, and elements uh, in order to be achieved. And um, we also know that the just transition tries or aims to put together the environmental, the social and the economic aspects. But we also know that it will look different for every sector and for every region. We also know that climate change is affecting, like you already mentioned, workers, communities, and families in many ways. But we also know that we're going to need to transform. And when we're transforming, um, there will be impact in the labor market. There will be impact in the people working around the world. I think, Samantha, you touched upon this uh, right when you started talking. I mean, we, we are all workers, right, um, around the world. And so one of the things that we are wondering here, and if I could um, so how, how are we going to do this transformation and how are we doing this transformation also matters, the how. Um, so what I'm wondering here, and it will be interesting to hear from you, and if I start perhaps with Le Bougain this time, um, on how can just, transition be, can just transition be an opportunity to address uh, poverty? Can it be an opportunity to address um, inequalities and decent work? Um, thanks, Katerina. I, I think, you know, especially um, for South Africa, uh, I, I won't pretend to know what <laughs> it means for other regions, um, but I think for the global south, particularly with the challenges that we face, so we have that triple threat of, you know, high unemployment, um, high inequality as well levels of poverty. So what the just transition means for us is an introduction of a new sector, which is the renewable energy sector. And with the introduction of a new sector, there's definitely new opportunities. Um, so for us, and, and you, you, you mentioned something quite important um, when you started that the just transition means different things um, for different constituencies, um, for different regions. I think if I had to speak specifically for the working class in South Africa, the just transition means the creation of jobs. So if there's no creation of jobs, you can't call it um, a just transition. And, and if there's no uh, creation of decent jobs, we really can't call it um, a just transition. Um, I think 10 years ago, there was quite a number of, of, of good um, policy um, discussions that were happening around the possibility of 1 million climate jobs and how that would offset the loss in currently coal intensive jobs. So that right there was a good opportunity um, in the sense that we were starting to look at the creation of jobs and significant jobs. I mean, a million jobs for a country like ours with unemployment in the expanded definition of about 4.3% is, is significant for us. So the creation of 1 million climate jobs for us seems to be a significant opportunity um, when you look at the issue of a just transition. So it's not just the issue of jobs, it's also looking at skilling um, our working population. So we have a working population that's to a large majority unskilled and that's because of um, the history of South Africa. So what this, what this, transition comes with, comes with the opportunity for lifelong learning, as well as reskilling in order to take um, advantage of opportunities that exist in the 
the challenges that currently um, or opportunities that currently exist in the renewable energy sector. I think the, the last thing I want to touch on, which we view as an opportunity. So we all often talk about the mineral energy complex in this country, how uh, monopolized it is and how it currently sits in the hands of very few players, which enhances inequality really. So in, a, in, in, in transitioning to this new renewable sector, what we're hoping to do is to address the issues, the ownership crisis um, in the country, seeing more cooperatives coming into the, um, coming into the renewable energy sector, communities um, owning the resources that come out of their communities, workers being um, owners of the means of production, um, having women cooperatives um, emerging as owners of the means of production. So this is what we see as a, as a good opportunity, especially when you look at the creation of, of, of the renewable energy sector. And I think I'm just going to leave it there. I think we'll have a chance to talk more about this. Thank you very much. And, um, and, and very interesting that you bring, um, or important that you bring this issue of ownership. Um, it has it has been a strong thing also in the report, but also every time we we, we connect and talk to people uh, and to trade unions. And for those that haven't had the opportunity to read the report, there's a case study also on the Philippines that also touches upon the, the issues of cooperatives. Uh, but Samantha, would you like to add a few words on this uh, connection between poverty reduction and just transition and the opportunities within it from your experience? Sure, and I just want to build on what Ngabahong said, really, because, um, you know, even, even uh, in, in every part of the world almost right now, we're in a huge crisis of unemployment as well as a public health crisis and also a social protection crisis, right? And in many countries, people are just fighting for, you know, the bare minimum to feed themselves and their families and keep, uh, you know, not become unhoused. And so, Whatever we thought, you know, we definitely would have said before this that just transition, um, you know, it's characterized by workers and their unions at the table, always social dialogue. But then after that, it is definitely about the creation of decent jobs. But now when we talk about just transition with, with, our, with our unions, our affiliates around the world, we start with jobs and we end with social protection. And I can go a bit further than that and say that um, most of the unions that we're working with right now are in high emitting sectors, especially like energy, power, and mining. And you, you know, there you there is no conversation that you can have about climate change or about transition uh, with people who are in you know relatively secure jobs right now, as as they see it that doesn't start with a new decent job for them and with a pathway that includes, you know, skills and income support and, and other forms of social protection. And, um, and I think, I think that that, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of, uh, the bottom line for any effort on just transition is that it really does have to be about making sure that there are new jobs and the new jobs are good jobs. And then the other part that I wanted to highlight, because you know we do talk about jobs a lot, but there are a lot of people who are not in work, and there are people who are not able to work. And so, just transition also has to rest on this foundation of social protection, so that people have their basic human rights of, um, you know, food, water, housing, uh, dignified old age, healthcare, education, all of those things. Those are all part of social protection, all those public services. And without those, it is also really like very difficult to get a just transition. And when we think about just transition, just to round off on a couple of the other themes that Lebo raised, I mean, in the International Labor Organization's guidelines on just transition, which for us are sort of the you know, that is how we think of just transition. We fought for those guidelines for a couple of decades in the UN, we have them. Um, the, the point of the world of work, so also the point not only for workers and unions, but also for governments and capital owners, is that we are going to have a society where the world of work makes people's lives better where it eradicates poverty, where people who today are locked out 
of the economy, like women, like racialized communities in, in, in some countries, like uh, poor and working class households are locked out of different parts of, of the economy and of a decent society, that a just transition is also supposed to fix some of those things. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you um, for those comments around the opportunities and, and, and also already touching upon the challenges that we will bring uh, a little bit towards the end of our conversation here. And it's, uh, it, is, it is at the essence of just transition, at least uh, from what I've been talking and, and listening to, to trade unionists around the world, that to bring this component of social justice and how we can move together as a society to actually move into a greener society within planetary boundaries but also be a component of transforming the inequalities that we have and that brings us to the another uh, block on um, that also we touch on the the report uh, on the issue of capacity building and also sharing experiences and strategies and what we would like to hear from you is that you know as you were saying Samantha, you were bringing like you're working a lot with affiliates in in the heavy industry sectors, for example. Um, we could, and we know that transition will affect some sectors and some regions first. So there is a, a crucial part here also on developing best practices and sitting together and, and looking into the experiences and building experiences together between trade unions. Um, so it would be interesting from this like strategic um, capacity building exercises and I know the Just Transition Center has carried out uh, or facilitated several of these conversations. If you could share, uh, Samantha, one of the experience with us or lessons learned. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I mean, I can just speak about something that we were doing this week, right? Or two things that happened this week um, and that can give you a sort of flavor of, what, what, of what's happening elsewhere. Um, so one thing that happened this uh, this week was that we ha we're working a bit with Kosatu because Kosatu has a large initiative on just transition that's leading South Africa. I won't say very much about it. That's uh, for Lebohang. But just to say that we had a longer conversation with, with Lebo about where things are. And we got some ideas from that conversation that we then took into another process that we're um, sort of co-facilitating with industrial Europe. And that process is about just transition and um, the power and heavy industry sectors in Central and Eastern Europe. So, you know, for developed countries, maybe some of the hardest questions that you have, because you have a group of countries that are very coal dependent, and some are amongst the poorest countries in Europe. Um, mass migration of young people out of some of these countries because there, there isn't decent work, large amounts of informality, and so on. And in that discussion about, um, you know, uh, basically, which consisted of a unions only session, a session with unions and employers, and then finally a session with unions and a senior representative from uh, the European Commission, we brought in examples from what Kasatu is doing. Um, but, I, but of course, we also had lots of examples from the region. So one of the things that we find is that um, the best way to help unions mobilize themselves on just transition is to hear from another trade unionist in the same sector, ideally, but not necessarily, who is actually working on just transition. What they have done, what worked, what didn't work, how you might do it yourselves. So this idea of, you know, peer-to-peer -peer learning as opposed to someone coming and like telling you how you should do, which is not very effective, We've, we find that that is really successful and it's something that is really consistent with our trade union values as internationalists and also our values of you know, solidar mutual solidarity and collective action. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I even, as Union to Union, been invited to some of those experience sharing and yeah, that is definitely something that we as an organization that can support unions that has this privilege of being able to support what, what unions are doing around the world. It's something that we 
we definitely think it's extremely valuable and very much agree with what you're saying, Samantha. But Le Bougang, would you like to share a little bit on capacity building peer sharing from Kosato and your experience in South Africa and internationally, because I know you've been active also uh, in nationally and internationally. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Katerina. And I think that's the value of um, being part of um, an international trade union confederation and having the Just Transition Center to support us. I think the, the I'm not too sure if they realize that, you know, the work that they churn out, the reports that, you know, they, they bring out, we're reading, <laughs> we're looking at some of this work and we're looking for creative ways um, to do um, some of the things that we've heard other trade unions have been successful in doing. And that's really what's helped us um, to get this far. Um, I think last year this time, um, ourselves um, at, at, at COSATU head office, we sat and thought, you know, we can't sit around asking for government to, to, to bring us a just transition. Um, at the end of the day, if there is no just transition, it's the workers and communities that will be most affected. Um, it will be jobs that are the first to go um, when we transition and it's in a manner that's not just. So how can we look at a way on a big scale, can we start to pilot for ourselves? Because that's, that's what we, we noticed. Asking government for a, for a pilot um, was a pie in the sky. Um, we were going to have to lead um, that discussion. Um, so after we noticed that, you know, um, the, 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 the power utility in South Africa, which is the major producer and generator of electricity, well, ran into financial distress, we then saw that as an opportunity. While everybody else was, 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 was bemoaning the fact that it ran into financial distress, we noticed that as an opportunity um, so that we can come and take on some of the debt for them through um, workers' pensions, um, convert that debt into equity, which helps us to achieve a long-standing resolution for us to be owners of the means of production. So we then went into a process of acquiring the debt, converting the debt into equity, and then workers would then become the shareholder. So because this power utility, it produces all of its energy through coal energy, because we're now the shareholder, we can lead the just transition debate. So that was one of our conditions for um, taking on the debt, transferring it into equity, um, and also a tempo with the business model of the power utility. So as part of the turnaround plan, we've called for the power utility to consider exploration into just transition. We have started with a whole gas initiative um, and then in the long term to the medium and long term, we're looking at you know, going into renewable energy and the power utility um, generating renewable um, energy. So that's how we, on a large scale, um, trade unions are now starting to actively participate um, in calling for the just transition, not just to call for it um, on the sidelines and whether you get recognized or not, that's up to government to decide and that's up to for enterprises to decide. This is a, a way in which um, we could now be active participants uh, of um, workers pay this work, um, becoming the shareholders and also leading the just transition debate um, uh, from from the front really um and i mean we're, we're we're still in the process it's a year in we're still in the process but i think that's those are some of the things we've been able to benefit from being part of you know the the peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, processes um i was speaking to sam um, during this week that you know we're about to get the presidential climate change commission up and running and really what that's coming up from is what other trade unions have been able to do by bringing government by bringing businesses by bringing community constituencies and workers to the table to negotiate a just transition plan for the country so we've been able to really just take what other trade unions have done put in our local flavor and region flavor to it so that we can bring about um, a just transition and um, so, so that's some of the stuff um, um, that we're, we're working on. We're hoping that in the next year, <laughs> we can start to talk about the fruits of it. Um, but I think the fact that we, we've started this process and we're starting to see the type of structural change in the right direction um, is already an indication that you know, trade union power um, can bring about a just transition. Yeah, and thank you so much, both of you. Um, but it's also, and it is also a, a combination of where you're saying, like the possibility, like the enabling environment existing, but also you mobilizing, mobilizing your workers around and saying that this is an issue. Like 
don't, it doesn't matter if we like it or not. I mean, uh, there was a trade unionist telling me this the other day, like it doesn't matter if we like it or not, the changes are coming. Are we going to go and influence them? And that's a lot of the, the strong component within Just Transition. It's to, to give the space, the political space and the voice for, for the workers to, to shape those policies um, in the future. And that, that brings me to um, back to the report uh, and some of the challenges and the barriers that you identified uh, Samantha, together with your team, and, and we, we looked at it also, um, that just transition, yes, it, it, can, it can have uh, fruits, but and as, um, as it has been happening in South Africa, it doesn't mean it's going to be fast, but there are also very key barriers to it. Uh, as we were saying, like social dialogue, it's like a fundamental piece of ensuring a just transition, building it together. But in the countries from our report, for example, and in other countries, many countries around the world, there is lack of social dialogue. There's also systematic violation of fundamental human and labor rights. There's high unemployment, informality, several issues that you already touched upon, gender inequalities. Um, so Samantha, would you be able to comment a little bit on that, that those connections between just transition and those challenges um, for us. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, as you said, uh, you know, the report really brought out some of those issues. And I think one thing we can all say is that um, violations of labor and human rights have only gotten worse during the pandemic, as well as more people being unemployed more people being excluded. And then finally, um, a big you know, push by many employers and governments even to roll back labor rights and to increase informality of work. And we see that even in countries that have pretty high union density. I also do want to say, though, that um, in most countries, our, our unions, including our affiliates, have had amazing success at pushing for social protection and income support packages for people during the crisis. So I don't want to take away from all of the work that people have done and the, what they have managed to get for poor and working class people. There are people who are going to make it through the pandemic with their families because of what trade unions have done. Um, so not to take all the credit, but to say that, you know, uh, it is it is amazing. We would never have thought we would get some of these kinds of income supports um, until until it happened. So what I mean, one thing that we the, the way that we will sometimes try to explain this connection between rights and just transition is, you know, there's no just transition without social dialogue. There's no social dialogue without trade unions. There are no trade unions without labor rights and there are no labor rights without human rights. And so, um, so in countries where people are not allowed to organize themselves, where the government or the employers prevent people from forming trade unions and having collective voice, then you're, you can't have a just transition. It's as simple as that. In our work, we're sometimes approached by, for example, by employers or sometimes by governments, or we're in processes where governments are involved. I'm not gonna name any names, but I bet you know who I'm talking about where you know the government's like well we have a you know we have this just transition process we're like okay but there are no unions involved in this right so you've you know you've made a plan which involves uh let's say the closure of coal-fired power plants or coal mines um but there's no there's no social dialogue anywhere near it and there's no plan for there's no like expanded social protection and no plan for new and decent jobs for workers so I think that the, so I, I just, just to make it short again, I mean, the, where, as in so many countries, we don't have uh, the, the rights of workers that, that are in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that are rights that have been negotiated under the ILO, then it's impossible for a, us to get a just transition. And so, you know, the, the work starts with that. Um, I will also say, though, that as, as you know, um, I mean, people are not helpless, right? So 
also where workers are not uh, not allowed to organize themselves or informal workers who don't have those structures, they do organize themselves. And they form, you know, very powerful and effective in informal workers associations. And some of those are documented in the report. Yeah, thank you for highlighting uh, that and, and also to bringing like almost two of the recommendations from the report on the crucial issue of guarantee and safeguarding the enabling environment for a social dialogue, but also protecting uh, labor core labor rights. Otherwise, it's very difficult to mobilize uh, around environmental issues when you're already persecuted for uh, organizing just for core uh, labor issues. Um, can we hear a little bit from South Africa? also and on the challenges and the barriers that you, you, you face. Um. Yeah, so at the risk of um, repeating most of the things that Sam said, um, you know, the increased fragmentation amongst, you know, constituencies, amongst government itself. So what we were seeing was that each department of government had a differing um, understanding of what a just transition was. Um, and that was, that's why we then saw the need for a common platform for social dialogue, where we will push one plan um, for the just transition. If you don't have those, those institutions and those platforms for social dialogue in place, I think that's probably the biggest pitfall if you are trying to um, formulate um, a just transition and develop a just transition plan. So we also identified, you know, social dialogue as being quite key. Um, so yeah, so the, the 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 large informality, large precarity in you know the labor market is also not going to do us any any favors if we're trying to push towards for a just transition. There is no way in a worker who is in a job that is currently well they view it to be decent and they have so so much labor protection um, as a result of collective bargaining over the years is going to leave that in favor for some sort of idealistic position on a job in the renewable sector if that job is going to put them in a level of precarity um, th there's no way that is going to happen so if we don't if we don't fix you know those fundamental labor rights if we don't get those and we don't get businesses to 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 commit to those it's very difficult for us to make a case um, for the just transition it'll never work if we're going to increase workers we're going to make work in more informal and we're going to increase workers um, precarity it's, it's just not going to happen so we've insisted that, you know there needs to be a an astute understanding of collective bargaining as well as labor rights um, from the beginning um, so that it then becomes a seamless transition workers are not going to shortchange themselves to take something that they think has been quite good for them over the years for something that they perceive to be less than what they currently have um, and that can't that we can't even call that a just transition. It's not. Um, you're taking uh, you're taking less um, than what you were usually used to. That's when you will you will see the resistance um, from workers. Another thing that that we saw um, was that if, if because of the high levels of unemployment, if we don't show workers a just transition, it's going to be very difficult for them to agree to transition. So you can't we can't sh we can't give workers principles on a just transition for forever we we have to start piloting this thing so that they see what we're talking about um i once did a, a, a i once did a workshop right in the heart of one of the hardest regions affected um by coal clo coal power plant closures and and one person asked me where are these jobs if you're asking me to transition where are they and if you can't answer that question you see then that's where the challenge starts and i think that's that's what we've been trying to do um especially at the level of course i do that we need to start piloting we need to start showing workers that yes these are prim uh, principles of a just transition but this is what a just transition looks like without which it's very difficult to convince um, um workers because at the end of the day that's the fundamental question that they will ask over and above the campaigns over and above the policy positions where are the actual jobs and 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 what what am I what am I exchanging for my current job? Is it something that's less than what I currently have? And and that's this that's the type of thing we need to do. You know, we always talk about negotiations and negotiations in, in good faith. That's when we begin to negotiate with workers in good faith, when we start to answer the where 
and we start to show them what kind of jobs um, that we're expecting them to transition to. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's what's been the challenges for us thus far. Um, just before I give you the word, uh, Samantha, um, one, we have a question uh, that we would like to get to, but also uh, I'll give you the word right after the question. And yeah. yeah, so a question from the audience. Were there any surprises, very interesting examples which you find while preparing this report? Hmm. Uh, and secondly, will this report be published every year? Katarina, Samantha, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great question. I'll, I'll pass the word to you, Samantha, right, right after. Um, we have no decision taken on uh, doing the report annually, but we definitely look as unit to union uh, as um, looking further into what kind of uh, affiliates and sectors are, would need and would want to have uh, more support when in relation to building their capacity around just transition. So it's definitely something we're going to continue from our side. And when it comes to surprises, I think, no surprises, but perhaps one of the, the case studies show that there is so much happening. These are just a few case studies. There is so much happening. There's so much trade union response. Uh, please, Amanda. Yeah, thanks. I was just going to support what Ngebohang said, which is that in pretty much every process where we've been involved in, you know, not only in the Global South, but in the Global North, that, um, you know, there's no, no person who wants to lose her job, right? So when you, when you come in and you say climate change is the thing, and unfortunately that means that, uh, that the plant is gonna, is gonna shut down. And uh, maybe, you'll, maybe if you're lucky, you're gonna get some benefits um, at the end of it. Like no one is gonna welcome that. Um, no, and and I, I think that's, that's, that's a pretty key thing. On the other hand, when the new jobs come on the table, like in a very concrete way. And we, we sometimes do work that you could call setting the stage for collective bargaining, like getting employers to come to the table um, with some of the affiliates, you know, using whatever we can to try to support that process or supporting affiliates and negotiations with governments. And when the money comes on the table or the employers start to negotiate a collective agreement, then people's views change because they see, yeah, I'm going to have a job. I'm going to get education for my next job. I don't have to pay for it myself. There's a pathway for me. My pension will be secured. Um, my community is not going to go under. I'm not going to have to move to the other side of the country to become part of a mobile work crew, right? So, so it's just the point of just transition is indeed, it's not just about the principle getting things for workers that actually improve the material conditions of workers where people are have hope they see that there is a future for them in terms of the report i think the i think lebohang mentioned one thing that came up strongly more over and over again and that was about ownership um, this issue of ownership and in a lot of uh, in a lot of developing countries you know, attempts to privatize um, public services, especially the power sector and utilities or energy companies, what that means for workers in terms of job losses. And it wasn't really a surprise, but it did come up really strongly. And I think the other thing that came up was just, as you said, Katarina, the, you know, how much people were doing, right? So, um, and also how, Hi, the awareness is in a lot of countries and unions in a lot of countries about climate change. So this long process of, you know, climate negotiations and awareness building, whatever, people are very generally quite aware that change is, is coming and in some places really aware that they want to do something about it. Thank you. Um, and unfortunately, our time is really running out uh, of time here, but I would like to give you uh, like a final comment um, so you, we can wrap it up before. Yeah. And please. Um, thank you, Katerina. And, and thank you for this very good um, 
conversation um, and it's a conversation that needs to to to, to be had um, I think ever since I started in in Kosati, we, we've been talking about a just transition and, and 2020 we're still talking about it but there's value um, in these in these conversations because they've helped us to unravel a lot I think the more we've talked about the just transition the more we've taken it to our affiliates the more we've taken it to our our regions we've understood the value um around um the just transition and and, and that's what i think has been the key to 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 some of the things that we've been able to do just going to our affiliates um, um having conversations around this you know your report highlights just how much uh, trade unions are doing um on the just transit because we have a certain ownership <laughs> of this process it is a trade union concept um we we have an ownership we we want to own it even though it, it's turned into a bit of a buzzword of, of some sort but i think we truly understand the essence um of a just transition um in one of the workshops that we do um we ask the participants um, can you recognize an injustice? And it's almost immediate. You know what an injustice looks like. Um, there's no question about it. Now tell us what justice is. And that's usually when the room gets quiet because now it becomes quite um, difficult to identify what justice is. Very easy to know when there's an injustice, not so easy um, when you have to point out what justice is. And I think that's, that's the complexity that's come with this process. Um, that's because justice means different things to different people background um, background what you believe in as your core beliefs um, will point to a different set of what you believe to be justice and I think that's what's been really interesting um, in this process we've been able to pick people's brains we've been able to pick particularly workers minds um, when I came into Kosato, people th thought that we only care about workers and, and, and salaries, and, and that's about it. But really what workers want, yes, they do want their livelihood, but really they want their communities um, um, to be active. They want their communities to benefit um, from a just transition. So I think the, the work is, 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 is it's a satisfying uh, a piece of work. <laughs> Um, because of what we're trying to get um, from this just transition. But I think what we've been able to get from, you know, workers um, has, has, has surprised us, um, especially considering how much they care about their communities, how much they care about livelihoods, how much they care about well-beings, and how they believe that this process of a just transition will help us um, to achieve all of that. Thank you. Um, uh, thank, both, thank you both of you uh, for this lovely conversation and thank you Susan also for joining us. But before I give the word to Susan, I just want to say like it's been a privilege and, and great to work together and to put this report together and we really look forward to 2021 through opening more um, conversation spaces like this to bring different issues like informality, ownership, and inequality, gender, and in relation to this transformation. So please, uh, all the people listening to us, stay tuned. Ask the song. Yeah, so we want to end a little bit in the same way that we started by a poll. So uh, let's, uh, let's do that. Because with this uh, webinar is about how can a just transition be used as a way to tackle development challenges and now we want to see whether or not you guys think we have answered that question uh, so while you guys are voting i just also want to really say thank you to our speakers but also thank you to all of you around the world that have been joining us for today and we at Union to Union are currently planning our Just Transition activities for 2021. So feel free to get in touch with us if you have any feedback or ideas. So yeah, we would love to hear from you. And with that, I think it's time for me to end the poll so that we can see the results. And yay, we did it. Most of you guys think that we can use Yes Transition as a way to tackle development challenges. Woohoo! And on that positive note, I want to say thank you to all of you. And yeah, thanks for today. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you.